in the last few years, I've come to accept and take to heart what Carl Sagan said. He said that not only can science and spirituality coexist, but science can also be a profound source of spirituality. And I think that's a um, something that we all need to take to heart. When I was younger, I uh, kind of had a very difficult time with spirituality. I uh, I used to um, I grew up in a Pentecostal home, and uh, when I got out of that, I ventured into paganism. And, um, I owe a lot to that because that particular tradition uh, really expanded my horizons and helped me to think outside the box and now I'm agnostic um, and uh, very interested in parapsychology so I guess there's some residual uh, woo interest in there but I'm very skeptical so I kinda guess it balances out um, at the same time I think that uh, the questions encompassed by parapsychology and by philosophy um, when you're dealing with the mind-body problem, I think that those are extremely relevant to uh, humans. I think it's a timeless thing. Uh, philo philosophical questions like uh, whether or not there's life after death. Um, all these are timeless questions. The ancient Greeks were uh, asking the same thing. Um, and they had different uh, con uh, opinions just uh, like people do today. Uh, but at the same time, I think that uh, when you're talking about parapsychological research, you're talking about researching things that at least suggest that uh, the concept of uh, brain dependency and, and the concept that we're just lumbering robots, uh, as Dawkins would say, the, the, it suggests, these, these bits of evidence suggest that we're more than that. We may not be, but... Um, I think that we have to evaluate these things, and even if their, I guess, paranormality proves to be uh, illusory, if that proves to be uh, a chimera, I think that uh, we still understand a lot about ourselves in the process and how we think, uh, how we look at the world, how our beliefs influence how we see the world, and I think that all those things are extremely important. Um, for example, if I claimed that. Uh, I had psychic experiences, and I really did. Um, well, I guess I'm going to paint a little picture right here. Um, for a moment, imagine that I want you to think of the, the typical religious person and the typical standard religious fundamentalist. They follow dogma. They follow doctrine. And um, they're, they're not really expressing themselves. There's no room to really do that. I think that if you're doing that, you're not really being, or if you're following dogmas of any sort, you're not really expressing yourself and um, being a human being, being a true human being, as Bruce Lee might uh, say. Except he would apply that to fighting systems. I apply that to everything because I think it's a universal concept. Um, too often we as people like to have other people thinking for us. And as long as they seem to be experts in their particular field and, and it doesn't contradict our belief system, we accept what they say, uh, usually without question. And that's a problem. Uh, to a certain extent, I guess it's necessary because we can't know everything. But on a deeper level, when you're talking about people who tell you that they have the key to your salvation, that you need their dogma to uh, get into heaven, to get into the saved club, that that becomes a problem because you're not actually thinking about very important topics for yourself and any intelligent person needs to think about these things on an individual level without uh, the influence of doctrines and, and creeds we uh, we have to explore these things for ourselves I think that uh, I can't understand why people I can understand it actually, I really can, but I think it's it's silly and redundant when people follow other people's ideas and, and read books and say this is where divine guidance is going to be found. Uh, but when it comes down to it, 
some people have legitimate experiences, like out-of-body experiences. Some people see ghosts. Some people have near-death experiences. And, I mean, whether or not these things that represent genuine uh, glimpses into uh, an unseen world, or uh, whether they represent um, manifestations of our dormant human capacities or, or whatever, I think that uh, I can understand where those people are coming from because they're following their experiences. And, you know, you can't really objectively uh, measure experiences. So, to a certain extent, that's always going to have to be a subjective thing. But at the same time, I, I think that it, it's totally rational to follow your experiences. I, I think you still have to question them. But if you're denying what you've experienced, if you're saying that it couldn't have been a ghost, it had to have been a hallucination, um, that's just one way of looking at the experience. It doesn't really explain it. But um, I, I can understand why people believe in ghosts, why people believe in out-of-body experiences and whatnot. If they've experienced those things, then there's, there's nothing wrong with believing in them. Because, I mean, when you experience something, it becomes extremely personal, and it becomes impossible to doubt that thing, or very, very difficult. I think we can still doubt what we've experienced. Uh, whether or not it's rational to reject experiences or not is an entirely different matter. I think that we have to take people's experiences seriously. Uh, for example, if I were trying to create an experience, create a psychic experience, um, now, <clears throat> you could either interpret this as a psychic uh, manifestation, or you could interpret it as something else, like uh, conjuring. But um, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I wrote a uh, three-digit, or actually a four-digit number here. Mm. Kind of miscounted there for a second. But yeah, I, I wrote a four-digit number here, and what I'm going to get you to do, the walkers right there, um, I'm I'm going to get you to basically we're going to break this four digit number into two parts so we're going to be trying to get two digits at a time and you're going to be doing this at home I want you to this is basically going to this is an experiment to see how or if anyone can actually pick up um, the number that I wrote down the number I wrote down there's no mirrors behind me or anything you can't see any reflective surfaces I made sure of that but uh, we're going to break this into two parts to make it easier for you at home. Uh, I want you to imagine a board just like this one. In fact, you can look at this if it, if it helps you. I want you to project the numbers you think that uh, I've written down onto the board. Before you do that, I'm going to help you out a little bit. Uh, the first two digits, are there. Uh, I'll go ahead and tell you there it's an odd number. But uh, at the same time... Try and get into a really passive frame of mind to pick this up. It's an odd number between 1 and 50, and the numbers are the same. So it could be 11, couldn't be like 15. Uh, but yeah, so just imagine those numbers projected out up here. <clears throat> get in a really passive state of mind. Just focus on what you are receiving, what you're picking up. Don't think about it too much. Just go on your first impressions. Doing very good, I'm thinking. If you're doing this, uh, if you are. Um, all right, so I hope you've got the first two digits. I'm going to say you do. Uh, the next two digits, we're going to try and get those now. And this is going to be an even number above 50, and the digits are different. So it couldn't be 66, but it could be like 68. Just uh, go really passive, become passive, and just see what you pick up. Just uh, go on your first impression. First impression. Always do that. If you don't go on your first impression, this probably won't work. So, uh, the number you've gotten, comment with it. Or comment with the number you got. If uh, you get the number I wrote down, that'll be impressive. Um, I'm going to turn this around in a moment. I'm going to give you a few seconds to do what you got to do. But I want you to go ahead and comment with the number. Um... Or you could wait until after I show you the number, which is 3386. If you got that number, and I had to write it backwards because uh, the webcam is weird, but uh, the number is 3386. If you got that number, then um, you're either psychic or I did something really uh, funky. Um, yeah, if you got the number, comment.
if you didn't comment as well. Um, you maybe you only got one part of it, but uh, either way, I, I think that uh, that demonstration right there paints a really good, a really good picture of the issue and or the issues in interpreting experiences. We approach our experiences from a wide degree of angles, uh, and we can't really say that any are more rational than others because ra being rational is really a subjective thing. Uh, we can agree upon certain standards that uh, constitute rationality, but when it comes down to it, we're still not objectively observing something or objectively experiencing something. Only thing we're experiencing is our own capacity, our own mental capacity, and we're not even experiencing all of that. Um, or we are, but I don't think we're aware of it. We, the only thing we can directly experience is ourselves, uh, our own mind. And I think that the mind is something worthy and in need of exploration, but I don't want to get off on a tangent. I think basically if you're following your experiences, no matter what they are, if, if it makes sense to you, you're being rational in your own, you're being rational towards yourself. You're following your own sense of logic. There's nothing wrong with that. It's much better than following a creed or, or some agreed upon standard that people follow without question. Uh, you have to always question everything, even your own experiences, even your own perception of the world around you. But be true to yourself, and I don't think you can go far wrong. I hope you like this short little video that I decided to uh, make randomly. Now I'm going to go eat buffalo hot wings. Yeah. All right.